gentlemen, welcome to this uh, co-production from Invest Hong Kong uh, on ship leasing with my colleagues from Brussels, Paula Kant, and Berlin, Dr. Wing Hing Chung. Uh, my name's Andrew Davis. I head Invest Hong Kong here in the UK. Uh, though I'm not in London today, I'm enjoying the sunshine in the wilds of the West Country. So. Invest Hong Kong is a government organization from the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region and it provides a free and confidential service to facilitate the setting up of businesses who want to expand in Asia and using Hong Kong as their base. Now today we've got three great speakers on a very interesting topic of ship leasing and I'd like to kick off by asking Benjamin Wong to give us his 10 minute produ production. Thanks very much indeed, Benjamin. Benjamin, you need to unmute yourself. Right, it's great to be here the, uh, today uh, with Andrew, Paula and uh, Wing, and of course uh, our other speakers, um, Christian and also uh, Clarence. Um, so um, this, time I will be talking about the tax regime on the ship leasing and uh, I would like to start um, uh, the presentation with Asia. Um, next slide please. And next. Right. Now um, this chart actually um, shows um, kind of like life cycle of, um, of the ship. 90% uh, of the shipbuilding uh, around the world are actually being done in China in Korea and Japan here in Asia. Uh, and then um, half of um, the uh, world fleet are actually owned by Asian um, ship owners. And then uh, when the ship reaches um, the uh, end of its life cycle, 80% uh, of them are actually also demolished, um, uh, demolished over here in uh, Asia also. Uh, and uh, for the cargo itself, actually 4.4 billion tons of the world cargo are actually being originated, loaded here in Asia. So you can see that for the ships and also the cargo, they are actually um, uh, having a very strong gravitational pull here in Asia. And uh, I think for the ships uh, in the Chinese saying, uh, is kind of like um, uh, the leaves uh, fallen uh, down to the roots. So actually it starts here in Asia and also ends here in Asia. Next please. And over here, you can see the um, ship owning uh, nations, um, the top 10 of them. Uh, Greece, uh, everybody knows that is the uh, biggest uh, ship owning nation. Uh, mainland China is uh, at the third, and then Hong Kong, um, SAR is at fifth. If you put together mainland China and Hong Kong together, uh, the total tonnage is about 300, 308 uh, million uh, that we ton. So that would put us at number two. And again, um, so you can see that um, China, Japan, Singapore, Korea, actually you put them all together, it has a very strong represent representation of the ship owning nations around the world. Uh, next please. And the ship is meant to um, ship cargoes. And uh, just now I mentioned um, the statistics, which is uh, more like um, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, around the world. Now, what I would like to um, talk about is the um, situation right now, the current situation with COVID-19 and also the demand and supply. Uh, now, uh, for the iron ore price, actually, we are at six years high. Um, so um, in August, although this chart is showing only to July, but actually in August, actually, um, the iron ore price actually was as high as um, 130 um, US dollars. So um, for this actually is mainly driven by the um, import uh, demands from China. Uh, for um, the third quarter, the year-on-year -year, uh, demand actually um, have uh, increased by 24%. So actually it's quite su substantial. Uh, this is mainly driven by the uh, stimulus package uh, in China, in mainland China, uh, on infrastructure projects. And um, as we all know, uh, infrastructure projects, usually um, they are being used to boost the economy. So uh, it is not surprising that, that we'll be seeing other countries um, to boost uh, their infrastructure uh, to help the economy to resume. Next please. Now over here is um, a slide on container. 
uh, on the freight rate and also uh, the chart itself shows um, also the um, uh, freight in the, um, the charter uh, uh, rate index. So you can see that the pink one uh, is um, a bit jiggling, uh, but it's uh, going up. If you look at now, um, it has already uh, returned back to the pre-COVID-19 level. It's uh, very strong. Um, and of course, um, this very strong uh, container uh, freight rate is mainly driven by the um, supply crunch. With the COVID-19, a lot of shipping lines actually, um, they, um, they have shipped stop, uh, stopped um, servicing the routes. So actually the supply is um, under uh, short supply. However, what's, uh, that's why the freight rate has driven up so high. <clears throat> but then what it shows more is um, that the expectation um, of the growth um, in, the, in, the, in the demand for container freight actually um, is stronger than expected. So actually it means that the uh, recovery actually is faster um, than the expectation, uh, which of course is a very good sign for the uh, shipping industry. Next please. And then it um, goes to the um, recovery of the global economy. And um, this uh, graph actually is um, uh, taken out from the economist. So it shows the G20s, um, for, uh, the forecast of the G20 in terms of uh, recovery from the COVID-19. This, uh, this was done in August. You can see that um, China is the best performing one. Uh, the GDP forecast was um, dropped only from uh, about 6% to 3%, so it's still positive. Whereas Indonesia is number two, um, it's dropped to about zero. And then the third one is uh, South Korea is a negative number about uh, minus two, minus three. Uh, but these three are the best performing already and here in Asia. So I think um, uh, it is um, a, a safe bet um, if you know, companies or industry is trying to bet on one area around the world for the recovery first, then actually it would be the uh, Asia that is going to be recovering uh, fastest. Next please. Next, please. And next. Yes. And together with that, of course, uh, we need to have um, uh, financing and leasing for the uh, ships. Uh, can I go back to the previous slide, please? Previous one. And previous one. Yes. Um, so now uh, we have um, this. And next one. Right. Anyways, uh, now um, we have this tax, uh, tax concession uh, for the uh, ship leasing. So it's mainly um, a um, tax break for the um, ship leasing companies and also the ship leasing managers. Now uh, for the ship leasing companies, um, um, they will be able to enjoy a 0% tax on both operating lease and also finance lease. And for the ship leasing management companies, um, if they are associated with the uh, qualified lessor, um, the tax rate will also be 0%, whereas if it, if it is non-associated, then the tax rate is 8.25%, half of the normal rate. Next, please. And I think a lot of people, whenever uh, we talk about Hong Kong, uh, Singapore also jump into the mind. Now, this is a comparison between Singapore and Hong Kong on the ship leasing tax. For ship leasing um, profits is both um, 0%, for ship leasing management profits, uh, for Hong Kong, uh, associated companies, I mentioned 0%, other companies 8.25%, Singapore is at 10%. And then for Hong Kong, we don't have a uh, sunset clause, whereas for uh, Singapore, uh, it is five years and it's, it is uh, subject to renewal. Uh, for this, actually, we are expecting to be able to capture 12% uh, of the market in 10 years. Next, please. And I would like to also bring in these um, uh, two news on the arbitration. Now uh, we have uh, Bimco um, uh, Christian to talk about the uh, ship lease, um, uh, the new term ship. And I think um, actually uh, great minds um, think alike. That's why Bimco has done the uh, ship lease uh, new term sheet, whereas uh, we have done also the uh, tax uh, concession. Uh, now for, um, for Bimco, actually also uh, another bit on the arbitration is that um, together with um, uh, New York, London, uh, Singapore. Now Hong Kong is also one of the four arbitration venue in its uh, standard dispute resolution clause. Um, and also on arbitration, we have um, uh, this new arrangement with the mainland side, this uh, interim measure. 
what it does is um, it uh, is trying to facilitate the award of uh, enforcement of arbitration cases here in Hong Kong, uh, and at the same time um, to protect the rights and interests of the party. Um, so the measure actually includes uh, property, assets, evidence, and also preservation orders. So actually with this, it will be um, facilitating uh, uh, much better in terms of arbitration cases here in Hong Kong uh, involving the mainland side. Next, please. And marine insurance is also another uh, policy or another tax recession we have uh, concluded for uh, this year. Um, is actually even newer than the ship leasing uh, uh, tax regime. So the tax uh, is halved to 8.25% for all general reinsurance business and also um, the uh, selected insurance uh, brokerage business. Um, so for insurance side, actually, I would also like to mention Ayumi, uh, International Union of Marine Insurance. Uh, a couple of years ago, they have also chosen Hong Kong as their first overseas hub. Uh, and I think this is, of course, uh, targeting the growth of the uh, Asian market, no matter it is um, mainland China or Indonesia or the Philippines, Malaysia. So actually, this is a, a, a very strong market for the uh, insurance companies. Next, please. Um, so the last slide I would like to share is this one. Um, for those that have been following uh, Hong Kong on the Hong Kong Maritime Week in November, uh, now it has become the uh, Maritime Week 2021 because uh, we have canceled um, the one for this year because of the COVID-19. Uh, however, some events, they are still going ahead. For example, the LMAC, Asia Logistics Maritime uh, Aviation Conference, um, they will still be going ahead as a digital uh, conference. 17th and 18th of November. And there are also a couple, uh, a, a few other uh, events they are still planning to go ahead at, in a digital version. Um, so, uh, so when those are actually confirmed, um, we will also let you know. Uh, but for now, actually, uh, please uh, uh, stay tuned uh, for the LMAC. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. And I would like to hand it over uh, back to um, Andrew. Thanks very much indeed, Benjamin. Very interesting. Um, one thing I forgot to do at the beginning was just to a couple of housekeeping rules, just to remind everyone that this is being recorded and afterwards all participants will receive a PDF of the PowerPoints and a link to the recording, which will be on the Invest Hong Kong YouTube site. Questions will be live. So if you have a question, uh, when we get to the Q&A uh, session uh, moderated by Paula, um, use the hand function at the bottom, then we will unmute you and you can actually ask the question live. So thanks very much. Um, now I'd like to hand over to Clarence Leung from PricewaterhouseCoopers, who will give us a really in-depth deep dive into the profit tax concessions for the ship leasing industry in Hong Kong. So over to you, Clarence. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Nice to see you. Um, it's just some safekeeping. I think Andrew just mentioned it. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Okay, this is my details. Um, just in case if there's any questions that today that I cannot answer, or uh, you're a bit too shy to ask about questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email and I will try my best to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, next, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I actually talk about the details of the ship leasing regime as uh, introduced by Andrew, um, um, thank you, Benjamin. Benjamin set, set out the scene in terms of a whole range of different uh, policy that has been adopted by the Hong Kong government in um, in recent years, in particular this year, um, as to, to uh, promote the uh, shipping industry in Hong Kong. And um, <clears throat> I, I thought it would be useful actually to talk about, uh, give you uh, the, uh, the, the people online a, a bit of background of this piece of legislation and the purpose of this legislation. In fact, um, we, uh, well, the government and the, and the industry have been working since January 2017, which is about more than three and a half years ago now. Um, at that time, under the Financial Services Development Council, which was a uh, government body established in 2013 by the Hong Kong government, 
as a high level um, cross sectoral uh, advisory body to uh, kind of like engage the industry of Hong Kong to promote further development of the financial services industry and to map out strategic direction of development. And in that year, FSDC uh, actually took up a, 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 a job to study how to actually help the uh, maritime industry in Hong Kong, in particular maritime leasing. About one and a half years later, which is about 21st May 2018, one and a half years later, that committee actually um, uh, under the FSDC published a paper titled Maritime Leasing, okay, um, which set out the landscape of the maritime industry in Hong Kong at that time and actually make several recommendations to further promote the shipping industry, including uh, a suggestion to the Hong Kong government that um, they may want to actually consider to actually um, uh, to actually uh, uh, to consider actually to introduce a brand new ship leasing regime to help the ship owner in terms of the financing because Hong Kong as uh, you can see from the slides on the right hand side although it might be um, uh, uh, sheltered by our, by, by our screen, um, you know, Hong Kong really is to enhance the, the Hong Kong position as an international financial center. Um, and, um, and also they hope that the ship leasing regime can facilitate the ship ownership and operation further in Hong Kong and generate the uh, uh, further demand for the other maritime uh, business services. Uh, not to mention uh, at that time, um, you know, shipping really is kind of like from one of the backbone of the Hong Kong economy. They have over 800 shipping related companies in Hong Kong. And the reason why the Hong Kong government thought uh, the ship leasing regime is so important is because of the uh, particular high growth rate uh, of the ship finance, which is about 9.6% per annum during the 2014 to 2017 period. As a result of that paper published by the FSDC on the 21st of May 2018, the Hong Kong Maritime Port Board, which is another um, uh, Hong Kong government uh, organization, which actually helped to uh, look after the maritime uh, cluster in Hong Kong. They actually continued the good work uh, as done by the FSDC and uh, in, in under the Maritime Port Board, um, the one of the subcommittee, there are three committees there, but it's the Maritime and Port Development Committee. And um, I was uh, delighted to be invited as one of the uh, committee member um, to actually further study this paper, how to develop the uh, ship leasing regime for Hong Kong. And if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, um, in that uh, committee, we form a, a task force which has the, the tax people, we have the uh, financier, the banking people, we have uh, 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 ship lawyers, we have the um, maritime, the, the ship owners in there, together with uh, the policy driver, which is the, the Transport and Housing Bureau, and the tax expert from the government, the uh, Financial Services Office Tax Policy Unit, as well as our Inland Revenue Department. So, you know, we, um, and then um, after after this uh, 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 you know one and a half years work um, you know we uh, form this um, uh, promote uh, finally announced the ship leasing regime and the whole policy objective really is to provide a conductive environment to promote ship leasing in Hong Kong and uh, hoping to build a more vibrant maritime cluster in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. Okay, the details. So the whole bill is actually called the Inland Revenue Amendment Ship Leasing Tax Concessions Bill 2020. Okay, it was first actually announced on the um, 17th of January 2020, uh, this year, then it's followed by the uh, general public consultation. It was amended though, however, on the 21st of May 2020 this year. The reason why there was an amendment at such a late stage is because during the consultation period, 
the Hong Kong Inland Revenue actually sent our draft rules or the draft bill to the OECD for approval, for comments, okay? And uh, the OECD actually uh, uh, has uh, have some comments and that was amended on the 21st of May, 2020. So it is important to note that actually the, the Hong Kong ship leasing regime which Benjamin was mentioning about those 0%, 8.25 seems very attractive. And whether it is, is it allowable under the OECD guideline? Um, the OECD has actually reviewed those, uh, 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 the initial draft. And I understand that uh, they will review the final draft uh, later on this year. But uh, given that they have already reviewed the first draft, so you know, I don't expect them to come back and say that, oh no, that, 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 that's not okay. Um, at that time, the bill was expected to be passed uh, into law uh, by the end of June 2020. Uh, but in fact, it was actually passed um, in the uh, legislation on the 10th of June 20, 2020. And then a week later on Friday, uh, as uh, Benjamin was saying in his slides there as well, it was gazetted on the 19th of June so that the bill actually formally become law in Hong Kong. Um, the effective date though, although it was um, uh, passed into law uh, formally on the 19th of June, but that tax concession actually worked retrospectively. It actually applies to any sums received or accrued. What we, that, what we actually meant by that is that any leasing income or the incidental income actually accrued under your leasing uh, activities on or after 1st of April 2020 will be uh, applicable uh, under tax test concessions. Um, so what are the concession tax rate then? Okay, um, this new regime uh, is what we call a Section 14P start. Um, it applies to a 0% profit tax rate for qualifying qualifying ship lessor. So it's not just any lessor, okay? It's a qualifying ship lessor. And that qualifying ship lessor will have to be carrying out a qualifying ship leasing activities. And, um, and uh, as you can see the slides here, um, it includes a lot of the different type of leasing activities, operating lease, finance leases, which is, you know, uh, as defined uh, by the financial statements, uh, subleasing, some sales and leaseback transactions. So when we design the rules, we try to look at, you know, what are the most common uh, leasing transactions that normally happen. And we try to cater and uh, include as many as possible within that new regime so that people can actually use it, okay? Uh, uh, the other one, um, we have another definition, which is also very important is the qualifying ship leasing manager. Um, again, um, if, if that qualifying ship leasing manager, they have to be uh, carrying out a qualifying ship leasing management uh, activities. If you carry out with uh, associated corporations, it is zero percent under our 14P, okay? And as, Jer as uh, Benjamin mentioned, however, if you that if if that ship leasing managers um, carry out a qualified ship leasing manager activity, but then it's to a third party, the tax rate then would be eight point two five percent. Okay, people have asked me oh, why there was two different tax rate. Why is not zero or whatever? Okay, we you really need to understand the policy intent. The policy intent is really is to promote the ship leasing industry. Uh, um, you know, as part of the shipping, you know, uh, important function to support the shipping industry in a cluster in Hong Kong. So the policy intent is that, okay, we will be happy to provide a zero ten percent rate, provided they meet certain conditions. And um, based on our understanding, most of the ship lessor, which is the owner of the ship, is, is an SPV. So they don't really have any people, okay, uh, employed in the SPV. And that's the reason why we have a separate term called the ship leasing manager. Okay, that's where you know all these people are, and they are actually managing those uh, SPV. Okay, 
And um, as the policy intent is that, okay, for any qualifying ship that's sold in Hong Kong during the leasing business, it's going to be zero. If they tax the ship leasing manager, for example, ship leasing manager have a shipping contract with the ship that's sold and tax at 8.25%. But if you look at the shipping group as a whole in Hong Kong, all your income is from the you know, leasing activities. But then if the ship leasing managers tax at 8.25, then you have some tax leakage. And that is the reason why we have two different tax rate there. If it's for uh, associate companies, i.e. the whole group really in Hong Kong is doing ship leasing business, then you should, all your profit should be 0%. That, is your, that should be your effective tax rate for your operation in Hong Kong. But if you also do some business for third party who is, uh, is not a related party to you, then all this management fee income that you receive, the Hong Kong Indian Revenue say that, okay, sorry then, I want to tax you some money, but I will give you a preferential tax rate, which is uh, uh, a half of our standard tax rate from 16.5. Okay, next please. Okay, this is just a diagram to summarize what I uh, just mentioned before. Um, this is a typical uh, shipping structure that we have seen. Uh, in fact, many people use actually. Um, um, you know, there's a Hong Kong parent company. You can see next to it, BOD means the board of director in Hong Kong. And underneath it, they have a many uh, uh, ship less so, one, two, and three, they qualify ship less so established. And they all carry out ship leasing activities, okay? Um, it can be leased to an unrelated non-Hong Kong company, um, the next uh, ship lesser two and, and to a unrelated Hong Kong company, uh, ship lesser three to a related ship operator because uh, shipping, the, trans the, the actual transactions is so complicated, right? The, the, the different operating model. And then the ship leasing manager is next to it. That's where, you know, uh, I would expect that that's where all the people really are. And then you can see that the, the pink arrow there, that is actually represent, you know, they have a, um, leasing management agreement okay the ship leasing manager really managing those uh, spv because the spv doesn't have any employees they also provide the uh, ship financing and management services to some unrelated qualifying ship less so and then on the right hand side which I i'm not too sure whether people can can see it but um uh it just summarizes tax rate qualifying ship less so and there for those color uh, orange is zero and then for the qualifying ship leasing manager which is the pink and then if it's associate corporations, i.e. ship less so one, two, and three, because they are in the same group under the parent company, then it's 0%. But then it is to the, to the gray box, and with the party, it's 8.25. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, please. Okay, so we talked so many about qualifying ship less so. So what is a qualifying ship less so then? Okay, first of all, there should be a lease. And as I said previously, you know, we try to accommodate as many leasing transactions as possible. Finance lease are included, operating lease are included, subleasing under certain circumstances is also included. Okay, so what are the conditions for qualifying ship, ship less so then? These are the key summaries. There, there are a few more, but these are, in my own opinion, are the key uh, uh, conditions that people should be aware of. First of all, it has to be a corporation, okay? It has to be a company, which is fair enough. It cannot be a partnership because in Hong Kong, a partnership, you know, the tax losses generated by them can, can flow through to the shareholders, um, uh, similar to other jurisdictions. Uh, that's not the intention of the legislation. So it has to be a standalone company. Um, this, this regime really is for ship leasing company so we make a uh, distinction between a ship leasing company and a ship operator. It cannot be a ship operator. If you're a ship operator, we have our, uh, our bedrock Section 23B, which is also a very, very good regime um, uh, for the ship operator. But this regime is purely for ship leasing, okay? And as a ship less saw, okay, it has to carry out in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, one or more qualifying ship leasing activities, okay? And they haven't really carried out uh, in Hong Kong any other activities. For example, um, 
if you are doing ship leasing, but then in ship leasing, you're also doing some property investments business, okay, in the same company, no, that is not allowed, okay? It has to be purely for ship leasing only if you want to feel, uh, fall within this concessionary tax regime. CMC is exercised in Hong Kong. CMC, by all means, um, the next two points is the most important points, in my own opinion. Central management and control. And that's why, if you remember my diagram, I put the board of director in Hong Kong. So, i.e., you must have people in Hong Kong to exercise those central management and control for that leasing business. Okay, for, for, for a foreign group who wants to come to Hong Kong, okay, they, it means that they might need to employ people in Hong Kong or they seek on people in Hong Kong. And, um, you know, but um, in Hong Kong, uh, we do, there's no requirement that all the director has to be in Hong Kong. Uh, um, we have many practical experience whereby the shareholder might be in the US or maybe uh, in Europe, uh, maybe in China, you know, um, you know, they want to oversee their Hong Kong leasing uh, business. So they may have a very senior person also acting as a Hong Kong director and they're willing to come to Hong Kong, to fly to Hong Kong for, uh, for, for board meeting together with the Hong Kong directors. As long as the majority of directors, in my own opinion, are in Hong Kong and they have the, um, have the relevant experience, ship leasing experience, then the CMC should be considered uh, to be in Hong Kong. The other one, is what I call the core income generating activities. Again, this is kind of like a, under the base erosion and profit shifting concept. It talk about the activities, okay, the profit generating activities really, produce those qualifying profits, the, the uh, leasing profits, okay, has to be in Hong Kong by the, by the ship less so, which is fair enough, right? Uh, or because, you know, sometimes as I say, uh, most of the operating model, uh, the ship less so has is a as a SPV doesn't really have any people. So as long as the, the dark board director arrange it, arrange the ship leasing manager, okay, to carry out those activities on behalf of the corporation, uh, that's also acceptable. Okay. And the last point is about the activities that are carried out in Hong Kong cannot be done by a permanent establishment, a PE outside Hong Kong. So for example, if the Hong Kong lessor for, for whatever reason got a branch, as a, let's say in Japan, because it's a branch, so whatever they do in Japan is also taxable in Hong Kong. But the people actually are in Japan. These are not allowed. You know, those people has to be in Hong Kong. This is really consistent with the international tax environment under the BEPS proposal. Okay, And uh, 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 Hong Kong actually fully adopted the, uh, uh, these uh, to make sure that we actually comply, uh, you know, all the inter international test development. Okay. The final point, which is also important, is about the threshold requirements. Okay. In order to qualify as a ship less saw, there's some threshold requirements, and that is look at the group level. The first requirement is about the average number of employees. Okay. It has to be adequate in the opinion of the commissioner, and in any event, it cannot be less than two people, okay? Um, total amount of operating expenditure, again, it has to be adequate. In fact, this word adequate is what the amendment that I mentioned uh, before on 20th of May, after uh, being reviewed by the OECD. OECD says that originally um, the, the full-time employee two and 7.8 million uh, seems a bit low, okay? Um, um, we, I believe the IOD explained to the uh, OECD say that, well, uh, surely when you first come to Hong Kong, when you don't have that, that many leasing business, there's no way that, you know, a business will want to employ many, many people, which is uh, accepted by the OECD. Um, but they suggested may perhaps as the times move on, they will have more uh, uh, leasing SPV or the bis leasing business getting bigger and bigger, then surely, you know, just having two people or just having 7.8 million Hong Kong dollar is not going to be enough. And that's the reason why we put the adequate in there. Okay. Um, um, for the 7.8 million, uh, because we're talking about a ship less so, uh, and most people will know that, well, uh, 
um, you know, in a ship less so really, you don't really have a lot of expenses in there, except for the management fee, um, you know, the, uh, the ship, which is a capital expenditure, it's not a corporate expenditure, right? Um, interest expenses, interest expenses, okay, because unless so, we need to borrow money from a bank or from internally to purchase the ship, okay? Those interest expenses are considered as operating expenditure because of the business, okay? Unlike into some other industry whereby interests may, may not be considered as operating expenses, but in Hong Kong, for leasing business, interests are actually considered as a part of the operating expenditure. So um, hopefully that should not create too much of a problem, okay? Uh, Hong Kong $7.8 million is about US dollar one million only. Okay, next please. Um, that that uh, ship less so will have to uh, do a qualifying ship leasing activities, obviously, because it's a leasing business. So, uh, what is a ship leasing activities then? It's a leasing of ship, basically. And it's by the person, you know, but the person means this, the ship less so, to a ship less so, to a ship leasing manager or a ship operator. The reason why we have such a definition is to really to try to encompass um, uh, many different transactions as possible because we know in the shipping world, okay, all these um, shipping transactions have many layers sometimes and uh, some during that many layer, you know, that can be another ship lessor or can be a ship leasing manager or in fact, it's the, in this most simple form, is uh, leasing from a lesso directly to operator who use the ship to, to take the cargo from a, from a place A to B, something like that. But in here, we try to expand it, try to cover as many practical situations as possible uh, so that people can actually use this regime, okay? But having a ship leasing activity is not enough. It has to be a qualified ship leasing activities, okay, in order to fall within the regime. And what is a qualified ship leasing activities? Quite simple, really. That leasing activity has to be in the ordinary course of the operation, okay? I.e., that is your business, basically. So if you're SPV, then, you know, if you have a, sh a ship, if you're leasing it, then that will, should fulfill that condition. And there's also a, a, a definition for ship, okay? The ship has to be over 500 uh, gross tonnage. This is under our maritime uh, uh, law, okay, you know, to register the ship, okay, and navigate, okay, that is the important part. That ship has to be navigate solely or mainly outside Hong Kong waters, okay. Uh, in, other, in other words, really, this regime really look at international shipping business, okay. If you are domestic, i.e., uh, in Hong Kong, we have a, a ferry company, who actually uh, ferry the people from uh, one side of the island to the other side, this regime is not for this type of company, okay? Because the, you know, those ferry they use only use for Hong Kong. We have a separate tax regime for that, okay? This regime is to look at international shipping business, okay? And then finally, about the lessee then, because you're leasing it, right? So, you know, they have the lease and then you have the lessee. There's also some condition for the ship let's see. The ship let's see can be a ship vessel in the change of direction, uh, can be a ship leasing manager or ship operator, as, as the case may be. Okay, and it can be a Hong Kong or non-Hong Kong entity. So it covers quite a wide range of uh, different companies. Next, please. Okay, then the actual incentive then, okay, we talk about the 0%, 0%, so why do we want to look at this slide, Clarence? If you look at it, okay, there's some differences. For operating leases, AP means the accessible profit. So it's like, okay, is, the, is your gross lease payments minus all the deductible expenses. So capital expenditure, accounting depreciation of the ship is not deductible, okay. Times 20% only if you own the ship, okay. Only if you own the ship, okay. Um, own, if you look at the top uh, right hand corner, I think um, it's kind of like includes a let's see under funding lease, uh, Bailey under high purchase or under conditional sale. So 
owning doesn't mean the legal ownership, it also include the beneficial and economic ownership. So it's again, make it more flexible for the people to use it. Okay, if you own the ship, then we have this 20% there because in Hong Kong, um, when you're leasing the ship to a foreign operator, you cannot claim the tax depreciation or in the other jurisdiction, we call it the capital allowances, okay? In order to replace the 20%, uh, sorry, the, 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 the loss of the depreciation, we, we said we will only tax you 20% of that income, okay? And hence, that's why you have the 20%, okay? And then if it's for a funding list, funding list really means that uh, it's kind of like a finance list, although we have our own definition, but you know, uh, you can take it as a finance list. So in the finance list then, under the Hong Kong tax law, we don't consider it as a, um, uh, your ownership. So you, you're not entitled to the tax depreciation in the first place. So the accessible profit then would be the gross payments of the finance charges and interest. So it's not the gross lease payment, it's only the finance element because it's a funding lease, right? Minus all, the, all those deductible expenses, including any interest expenses that may, you might may incur, okay? Time the zero percent tax rate, okay? Final point, which I think is a very, very important point, very important, and it's different from the other jurisdictions. In the other jurisdiction, you know, when you own a ship that you're able to claim capital allowances, when you dispose of a ship, the money, the surplus is, you, you will probably have to pay tax on, you will bring the tax proceeds in the um, capital allowance pool so that you tax the whole lot. But in Hong Kong, because they had never given you the depreciation allowance, and they says that uh, if you own the ship more than three years, so they immediately before you dispose it, any money that you receive from, from uh, selling the ship is completely tax free. And that's why I think it's going to generate a lot of interest in there, okay? Because Hong Kong have an aircraft leasing regime, the rules are very similar. Uh, one of the big attractions when I talk to the aircraft lessor, why they want to come to Hong Kong is, you know, apart from the 20% or the 8.25, the aircraft leasing is 8.25, not zero, okay? Um, is the capital gain exemption because, uh, you know, they, uh, many people will buy and sell the uh, aircraft. In that jurisdiction, they will have to pay tax on the whole lot, but in Hong Kong, as long as they own the aircraft more than three years, they don't pay tax. And now the same condition apply to ship leasing business. Next, please. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, the, uh, similar to the ship lessor, uh, uh, as I explained, there's another important term for ship leasing manager. Um, again, it's very similar, the concept uh, for the ship lessor. Uh, it has to be a corporation. It cannot be a ship operator because it's a ship leasing regime. Um, it has to be carried out those uh, qualifying ship leasing management activities in Hong Kong, okay, and not elsewhere, okay. Um, the, the central management control has to be exercised in Hong Kong, similar to the ship less so. Again, the, the, uh, the core income generating activities, okay, what, what sometimes are called the substance requirement, has to be in Hong Kong, i.e. you really have, have, must have the people in Hong Kong, okay, uh, doing that, that business. And then there's also a threshold requirements. Um, it's going to be saying as a measure of group comp level. And I understand from the ILD uh, recently that they're going to uh, uh, have, provide some example to illustrate, you know, how do they look at group level to, for the threshold requirements. Uh, next, please. Okay, um, I didn't talk about the safe harbor, safe harbor rules actually. Um, there's some safe harbor rules uh, just in case for people uh, when, when, the, when the ship leasing manager may be also acting as a holding company and then they have uh, many uh, ship less so underneath it and then when the ship less so uh, paid dividend income, right? After many years, so suddenly in that particular year, they have a very big chunk of uh, dividend income which in theory is not a leasing management activity business whatsoever, right? It's a dividend income. So there are some safe harbor rules uh, for structure like these to say that, okay, um, if it's just one year, but then in the previous uh, two year, or when we look at the three years uh, concept, uh, your profit percentage actually more than 75% is from generating from a ship leasing management uh, assets and the profit, then you know, you will still um, 
satisfy that you are a qualifying ship leasing manager to qualify for the 0% and the 8.25% that uh, Benjamin and I have been mentioning um, in our presentation. The threshold requirements, uh, we have the number here in this slide. Again, very similar to the ship less so, we have two. First of all, full-time employees. In here, it's just one. So it's very, very low. But again, we are mandated to reflect the OECD comments, really. Okay, it has to be adequate. You know, um, uh, to start with, you have only a few leasing SPV, maybe one is enough. But for some of my clients, uh, they have hundreds of, of leasing SPV in Hong Kong. One clearly is not enough because you know having one person to manage hundred using SPV is not going to uh, work at all. Uh, total amount of operating expenditure again has to be adequate, okay. But in any event, it cannot be less than Hong Kong one million dollar, okay. Um, this threshold is much lower than the ship less saw. Remember, they are totally separate business. In a ship less saw, they will have a very big expenditure interest okay but for a ship leasing manager then really you have the employees you might have an office you might have electricity you might have uh you know all these um uh repertory filing or tax filing etc etc for your day-to-day -day expense expenses that's why the threshold requirements are quite different in that and then we try to accommodate um you know uh, that and then reflect it in the legislation um um, because it's a ship leasing manager activity, so it has to be a, um, uh, it's not a ship leasing activity, it's actually, sorry, that's a typo in my slide, but it's a, it's a ship manage, man, management, uh, leasing management activities, okay, and it includes a very wide range of financing and management activities related to ship leasing, including like setting up a, a company for ship leasing purposes, uh, managing the residual valuaries, uh, managing the insurance, um, uh, repairs, maintenance, and so on. As long as they are really in relation to the ship and then for the ship leasing business. Okay, um, next please. Okay, it's just a summary. Uh, That's my final slide. Um, um, yeah, 0% for associated corporation if you are a qualified ship leasing manager after you satisfy all these rules and conditions that I just mentioned and it's 8.25% tax rate for unrelated third party. Now, the final uh, few points, I'm not going to mention about it, but um, it's a concession tax regime. I, uh, I hope that you, you will find it very attractive. Um, similar to any other jurisdictions, when they have a tax regime come out, there are going to be a, a many anti-avoidance, okay? Transfer pricing, the ownership of, 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 of the uh, sheep, the main purpose tax, which is uh, very uh, common now in, in uh, international tax, what are the main purpose of you setting up a ship leasing company in Hong Kong? It cannot be for just, you know, for avoiding uh, paying tax, you know, because Hong Kong is zero. You know, there has to be a good commercial purpose. Um, you cannot use those Hong Kong uh, companies, you know, um, for treaty shopping. That's why you have those, those anti-treaty abuse. Um, in my own opinion, um, those are just, you know, this is the international tax landscape these days. So um, you know, um, whatever legislation that you look at, uh, whatever uh, different jurisdiction, they always have this type of um, legislation. So they're there um, just to avoid, um, you know, people are using Hong Kong uh, to do, um, to minimize the tax bill, that's the main purpose. But if you carry out a genuine leasing business, and even Hong Kong, then those anti-avoidance rules should not apply to you. And um, I think I'm just overrun a little bit and, and I apologize to, uh, to Kristen. Um, you know, that's the end of my presentation and uh, I'm happy to take any question and answer later on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Clarence. And that is a really detailed explanation of ship leasing. Um, very, very impressive. Um, now, I'd like to hand over to Christian uh, from BIMCO. He's the general counsel there, and he will um, take you through his presentation. Thanks, Christian. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity to, to participate uh, today and, and introduce uh, Shipley's, our new uh, standard term sheet for 
ship sale and leaseback transactions, which we published only a few weeks ago. Uh, I can see the time is really limited, so I'll try to be really brief, but let me still just uh, thank the organizers for making uh, time for this issue, which I, I hope and think will be of, of uh, relevance to, to many of you uh, attending uh, today's webinar. So just a few words about BIMCO and thanks for turning uh, the slide, that's excellent. Uh, so uh, BIMCO is the world's largest direct membership organization for ship owners, charterers, ship brokers, agents and other stakeholders with, uh, within the industry. Um, our members represent just about 60% uh, of the world's merchant tonnage, uh, which corresponds to, to over 1 billion deadweight tons. We are involved in a wide range of activities, including uh, regulatory matters, training activities, etc. But but one of our absolute uh, main activities over the years and and since 1905, when we were developed, is uh, when we were established. Uh, sorry, is is the development of standard contracts and clauses for the uh, entire industry, and we have a leading position in this area uh, worldwide and uh, develop standards uh, for all the major. Uh, segments of the industry and, and for the entire life cycle of the ship. And this brings me straight to ship lease. So the next slide, please. Uh, so ship lease is the third standard term sheet that uh, BIMCO has adopted since 2017. Uh, the two others being uh, traditional ship financing term sheets for, for term loan facilities, either bilateral or syndicated term loans. Um, and uh, ship lease uh, has been drafted by a, uh, an expert committee that was composed of ship owners, uh, leasing companies and lawyers. We try whenever we develop these uh, standard uh, contracts and clauses to involve all, all the stakeholders concerned. And in this case, we, we were very keen, of course, to, to involve the, uh, the leasing companies and and certainly the, uh, the Asian leasing companies. So we had four owner representatives from BW Group, uh, Navios, uh, Wakwong and Island Navigation. We had four leasing uh, company representatives from uh, CMB Financial Leasing, CDB Leasing, CSIC Leasing, and Minsheng uh, Financial Leasing. And then we had three private practice uh, lawyers from Linklaters, Mayor Brown and Hannaford Turner. So the reason why uh, BIMCO decided to uh, develop a dedicated uh, sale and leaseback term sheet, I think has already been qu made quite clear today by, by the other presentations in the sense that, that leasing has obviously become a very uh, popular alternative to traditional financing, uh, not least in, in Asia. Um, and uh, so focusing on the term sheet itself, uh, it has been drafted on the basis that it uh, sets out uh, indicative terms and conditions for a ship sale and leaseback transaction, but it does not itself create a binding legal uh, agreement. The terms and conditions of the proposed uh, transaction will once they have been uh, agreed, uh, be incorporated into a memorandum of agreement uh, a bare charter and related uh, security documents satisfactory to all the parties. Um, ship lease, as we have codenamed the new term sheet, has been based on the two existing BIMCO term sheets, so the two term sheets uh, that we call ship term and ship term S for, for term loan facilities. We published them in 2017 and 2018, and it was felt natural that we should uh, base the third term sheet uh, on, on, on these uh, two existing ones. And this also means that we used the, uh, the customary BIMCO box layout as part one. So the box layout, which you can see in a very small uh, format on, on the slide, on the right-hand side of the slide, is a popular feature of, of BIMCO documents as it enables uh, the parties to insert the variables that they have uh, agreed at the very uh, beginning of, of, uh, of the term sheet. And part two then contains the main provisions, uh, which provide uh, an overview of the transaction, followed by uh, specific sections dealing with the sale of the vessel, the chart of the vessel, and other uh, transaction uh, terms. And finally, a number of annexes uh, have been added, uh, so they make it possible for the parties to include more specific information about issues such as change of control and, and financial covenants. 
In terms of the scope of application, so ShipLease has, has mainly been developed for sale and leaseback uh, transactions involving secondhand ships, um, but it can be adapted to fit uh, structures involving new buildings or, or vessels that are under, undergoing major uh, refitting. But it was important for the subcommittee to sort of uh, focus its attention on, on what it considered to be uh, the most prevalent uh, ship sale and leaseback uh, structures. The term sheet is suitable both for operating leases and, and finance leases, uh, so it, it may have to be adjusted uh, in, in some cases, for example, by, by specific purchase uh, option or, or termination sum terms. And JOLCOs, French tax leases and similar structures uh, is not something that we have accommodated for. Uh, it, it was uh, simply felt that it would add too much um, complexity to the term sheet. Uh, but again, the term sheet can be adapted uh, as, as is the case for all uh, BIMCO standard contracts and clauses. You have the possibility as a user to, to actually adapt it to fit your, your particular needs. And then it's important to mention that chip lease comes with explanatory notes, uh, which set out the, the uh, subcommittee's uh, reasoning uh, and intentions behind the individual provisions. So this is standard for all uh, BIMCO documents and, and these notes will uh, explain what the, uh, what the drafting committee uh, had in mind and, and it will, uh, you know, the, the, the notes will also point to issues which the party should be aware of uh, if they use the term sheet for, for new buildings and, and issues which may uh, be different depending on whether the term sheet is being used for a, uh, a finance or an operating uh, lease. And so we're actually in the process of uh, translating the notes into Chinese and they will be available uh, soon. And by way of conclusion, uh, Andrew, I would like to say that um, ship lease is, is meant as a fair and balanced starting point for, for the parties' negotiations. We know there are quite a, a few newcomers in the market who may not have a standard available. And, and we also know that, that even more experienced users uh, may be, be looking for a reference uh, document. So ship lease is sort of meant as a, as a one size fits all document for them to use uh, and adapt to fit their, their particular needs. So I hope this uh, short presentation will have sparked some interest in the new form, uh, which can be accessed on, on the BIMCO website. So I see that the next slide has come on. That's excellent. So you can see uh, BIMCO's website uh, and you can see uh, my contact details. I, I don't know how much time we, we have available for, for questions. I'm happy to take them. But just to say that Shipley's and the explanatory notes are both available on, on the BIMCO website in uh, in, a, in a sample copy, so both uh, members and non-members alike can actually access uh, these documents and then you can use uh, SmartCon on, on BIMCO's uh, secure contract editing system, which is called uh, SmartCon. But uh, yeah, thank you for your time and happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much indeed, Christian. That was very interesting and I think the audience will have found that very useful. I'd now like to hand over to my colleague in Brussels, Paola Kant, to moderate the panel discussion. So over to you. And start video. Hello. Um, thank you, Andrew, and thanks to our three speakers. Um, we have already received um, one uh, question, two questions actually from Charles Kinsley, who has been so kind to write them in the chat, but we would suggest um, to unmute Charles so he can ask his question in person. Um, uh, uh, Charles, we have now uh, unmuted you. So, do you want to ask your question? I think there were four all panelists, but please tell us who in particular. Oh, yes, good afternoon, and, and thank you all to uh, Clarence, Christian, and, and Benjamin for their insights. Uh, Clarence, my questions uh, really are, are both for you. First one is with the recent uh, OECD pillar two comments that came out this week or ended last week. We are looking at targeting uh, uh, tax regimes where the the tax paid is is too low with ultimately whatever the light. with whatever the OB zero percent and I'm sure eight point two five will be below their acceptable minimum tax rate. 
Uh, yep. You did say that the OECD had, uh, I presume the word is blessed, the Hong Kong concessionary regime. Mm -hmm. uh, what will happen though in light of these Politu comments? Will that have an adverse impact or will they stand by their, their blessing for these structures? Okay. Um, thank, thank you for the questions, uh, Christian. Actually, I, I may not be able to get everything uh, that you say because uh, uh, there was some hiccup, but I think I, I get the gist of it. But if, there's, if my answer is not, in, uh, not complete, by all means, let me know again. Um, <clears throat> I actually been following the uh, trip on zero actually uh, uh, quite a lot because um, 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 that's in fact, you know, the reason why, if you remember my slides there, there's a 20% uh, concession tax rate, right? People ask me, is zero anyway, why do we care about 20%? Um, the, the reason why the LD designed the, the legislation this way is to really to cater for in case BEPS 2.0 is going to come, come, uh, 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 come out, um, you know, there is going to be a minimum tax rate, okay, uh, uh, coming, okay? So, so everybody will need to tax it, but because in Hong Kong, uh, um, if you're doing a cross-border leasing business, unlike the other jurisdiction, we do not give them the tax depreciation, hence that's why we have this 20%, that's a starting point. The other starting point, Point, when we were looking at it, and then um, uh, uh, before the consultation, the document actually public uh, uh, available, I think a couple of days ago, and although I received a copy, uh, which was leaked up, I was told, a, a, a few weeks ago, so, so I've been studying it as, as, as well. Um, uh, when, when, when we were designing it, we, we know that BEPS 2.0 is going to come, but how, what, what is the actual event? Nobody actually knows, because there was still a lot of, um, uh, 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 discussions really uh, within the OECD and all, all the countries, right? Uh, Hong Kong is one of the members, so so they've been attending it all the all the OECD meetings so that we can put understand it. Um, but no one knows. So the, um, but we we cater for it. Uh, that's why we have the two point zero in there. The way that I look at it, I think that, um, um, uh, you know um, that will have an impact in all the preferential tax regime. Okay. Um, in in uh, no one actually knows what, what, what is going to be the minimum tax rate. Um, uh, a couple of months ago, I was told that maybe uh, uh, um, uh, 13, 14, but now it seems that uh, maybe um, 11, but some people may say to me that oh, maybe a 12.5, just the Irish the corporate, corporation tax rate um, uh, are there. So the 8.25 and the 0% definitely, as you said, um, will be lower. And hence, you know, there, there would be a top up in Hong Kong if you choose, uh, you know, to, uh, to do in Hong Kong. But I have some observation, you know, in terms of this, uh, although I don't have the full answer, I haven't done the full analysis. First, op first observation, I think this uh, two point zero only applies to uh, corporations whereby they have a consult consolidated revenue, 750 million. Okay. So, um, I think not all the leasing company will, will, will apply, but for the big one, definitely, if that's applied, then you, 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 you probably need to miss, meet the uh, minimum tax rate requirement. But if you're not, then, you know, that 0% or, or, or 8.25% is it still stays there. That's how I look at it. Okay. Okay. To the extent whereby you have a consolidated uh, revenue more than 750 million, and then um, if your effective, effective tax rate is less than whatever the minimum tax rate that's going to be agreed by the OECD, then if you choose Hong Kong to top up, then you have to pay extra tax in order to avoid uh, this, um, uh, uh, the other jurisdiction, they might say that, okay, I'm not going to give, give, give you a, a lease deduction, you know, by the lessee side or the withholding tax, to the benefit, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, but in, in arriving, the key though, so far, I, I can uh, understand it. The key is really to look at what would be your effective tax rate in Hong Kong. In some of the leasing company that I've seen, and certainly apply to some of my clients, whereby they are part of a very big financing group. In Hong Kong, they might have a lot of different business. Leasing is part of that, okay? A ship leasing, aircraft leasing, uh, a small ticket leasing, as well as the banking or security, uh, they are all actually taxed at different rate. Okay, you this BEPS 2.0 is going to apply 
only. If the overall uh, tax that you pay in Hong Kong, let's say, uh, are less than the minimum rate. So if you have other business in Hong Kong which tax at the, the, the standard rate, let's say 16.5%, uh, uh, and if those profits are much bigger than the leasing profit, then I would argue and I would imagine, you know, um, those uh, leasing profit derived by the ship leasing, which is zero or 8.25, as the case may be, may not have any impact to, 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 to your business, even though, you know, on its own is, is, um, is less than the minimum uh, tax requirement. But as a jurisdiction basis, okay, for all your group business in Hong Kong, you might meet that. So, so it's not an easy answer. I think, um, you know, uh, people will need to look at the, uh, their, their own, own, um, own business in Hong Kong, really, and then how, uh, how much profits they're generating uh, in Hong Kong, and what are the appropriate tax rates for those business to see whether this minimum tax, based on what, what, what actually published so far, are applicable. In the other thing is also is that I have I think I've seen that um, you know the the OECD is still determining as to uh, how to look at the profits whether you should be accounting profits or whether they should look at the tax uh, depreciation in in um, in in there. Um, um, my discussion with the inland revenue because I'm an SS finance and leasing business uh, sorry expert really and I've been doing it over twenty years so I only I only do SS finance and leasing really. So, you know, do those big ticket infrastructure tech project. I know how important those are tax depreciation. For me, if you look at the accounting depreciation, it's not really your, uh, your accessible profit, you know, can, can I, uh, so be, uh, if I can say. So I, uh, I hope, you know, um, uh, uh, when people look at the uh, uh, capital intense industry, they will, they will take that uh, tax depreciation available into account and then um, I think, um, you know, uh, look at this, the, the rules, it seems that, okay, if, if as a result of the uh, tax depreciation or capital allowance available, and in that particular year, you turn out into a loss, for example, then those minimum tax may not be applicable in, in that year. So, you know, um, this is my initial reaction. I think you're right, that definitely apply. To it, but it doesn't just apply to Hong Kong. It would also apply to all these um, whatever preferential regime that adopted by different jurisdictions, because this is going to be uh, applicable to all, all the people who can sign up in in, in, in in the rules. But how is this going to affect them? I, I don't think it's not that easy actually. Um, but um, you know, the answer that I provide just my initial um, uh, uh, discussion with the Indian Revenue, how I see it. Um, it seems to me that they are all, also seeing this way. Uh, I think for the compliance of that's number 210 is going to be difficult. And I would imagine uh, also for the shipping uh, uh, community going forward. So, you know, it is important for those shipping uh, client uh, on, on this webinar to take note of uh, about this um, uh, BEPS 2.0. Thank you. Well, Clarence, thanks a lot for your detailed answer. Uh, Charles, I hope that was, um, that was a sufficient answer to your first question. Um, Charles, if you allow us, there's one question, uh, another question we got in for our BIMCO speaker. Um, Christian, uh, I, I assume you're, um, you're still with us. Um, I am. A, a I double am. question for BIMCO. Firstly, how important is Hong Kong as an arbitration center for the shipping industry? Um, and this is a question from a, a participant who had to leave. Um, so that's why I asked the question. And secondly, where do your members, the BIMCO members, maybe come from? Uh, and which countries uh, are using your contracts on a regular basis? So the two questions, Hong Kong as an arbitration center for the shipping industry and, and a bit more about your membership and the usage of your contracts. Thank you very much, Paul, it was a pleasure. So uh, I would say in relation to the importance of Hong Kong as an arbitration center for the shipping industry, what I, what I can say is that the addition of Hong Kong to, to uh, our dispute resolution clause, uh, in addition to the three other named arbitration venues, 
uh, reflects that, of course, Hong Kong's increased popularity as a center for dispute resolution and, and also uh, that it's ranked among the top uh, maritime arbitration centers in the world. But, but you can also say in more general terms uh, that the addition of Hong Kong uh, also reflects the importance of, of Asia in general in, in international maritime arbitrations. Um, I think I would leave it. Uh, we'd leave it at that. But that's certainly also, to, uh, by all uh, means, to to give a very uh, positive uh, positive uh, response to that uh, question. Um, and of course, now the reference a reference was made earlier to uh, to the addition uh, of Hong Kong. So what we did, uh, if I can just spend one minute on that, we, yes, we sort of okay, we, we sort of uh, combined the fact that that uh, that we had decided to add Hong Kong to uh, to the three existing venues, so London, uh, New York, and Singapore. We combined that uh, fact with uh, with with the with the BIMCO dispute resolution clause uh, having become uh, more uh, sort of longer and longer over the years, and it 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 was in the, it was in effect uh, one of the uh, sort of the longest clauses in in BIMCO's clause library. So we had a wish for some time to to develop a shorter uh, a shorter version of the clause, and then uh, combined with the fact that we were adding Hong Kong to the clause, we we saw a good opportunity to sort of uh, do everything in one go, and and uh, it has been a, a very very um, positive and rewarding uh, project to uh, to develop the new uh, law and arbitration clause 2020 as we call it uh, we have involved representatives from the from the four uh, arbitration venues uh, and developed a, a shorter one size fits all where you can basically uh, make your own choice amongst uh, the four uh, arbitration venues or of course uh, as you have always had the possibility to do you can uh, you can choose another venue of your of your own uh, choice, um, and so the new clause is significantly uh, shorter because it basically is uh, this more or less the same text for for all for all the four uh, venues uh, and also the the sort of the other uh, possibility uh, if you want to include your own own venue, and again this clause is available uh, together with explanatory notes on on the BIMCO website. Um, and uh, and one and one last comment I can say on that perhaps is that the um, the uh, mediation provision used to be part of the of the uh, BIMCO dispute resolution clause, but we have singled that out into a separate uh, a separate clause which will be available on on the BIMCO website. So the law and arbit arbitration clause 2020 only focuses on on uh, on on those uh, on on those uh, matters and um, and it, uh, it basically meant that we were able to to develop a, a shorter uh, and more to the point uh, clause. And then as far as the BIMCO membership is concerned, I think I touched upon it a little bit at, uh, in my introduction, uh, but we basically have members all over the world. We have 1,900 members just about in, in more than 120 countries. Uh, and we are represented in, in, in all, all the main uh, segments of the industry. Um, but when that said, it's important to, to mention that, that our contracts and clauses are being used all over the world and not only by by BIMCO members and not only by, by uh, stakeholders in the maritime industry uh, who are sort of uh, based in the 120 countries. So we, we are truly uh, worldwide and, and we develop uh, contracts and clauses for, for the entire industry uh, worldwide. So, uh, so you don't have to be uh, a member to, to use uh, the standard documents. Okay, Th thanks a lot for that clarification. Yeah. I think that was uh, also partly what the, the the person who asked the question was thinking of, right? Can everybody use those contracts? Um, since we have gone already a bit over time, is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Um, no, then thanks for hanging in there with us. It's a topic that uh, uh, is, uh, is quite fascinating. And I would like to hand the word to my colleague, uh, Wing Hing Chung from our Berlin office to the, make some closing remarks. Over to you, Wing. Thank you very much, Paula. And thank you very much um, to the insights given by Benjamin, Clarence and Christian. It was really, really interesting to learn about the importance of Asia uh, the continued attractiveness of Hong Kong as um, a maritime hub, and especially, especially of the importance of Hong Kong 
as a finance hub, as a global financial center, and the continuous use um, as a as an arbitration center and uh, and the role of the rule of law in Hong Kong. And I think this is just a testament to what the Hong Kong government um, is uh, trying to do, is trying to keep the city um, most attractive in, in Asia and in China, and to go forward with the developments, with the many, many exciting developments, hopefully post-COVID soon, and um, to, uh, to, to stay attractive to all businesses from all around the world. And um, I just wanted to stress that um, we from Hong Kong, Invest Hong Kong, stand ready to, to serve all, all our clients from all over the world. We here in Europe, um, by Paula, Andrew, and myself here in Berlin, and then, of course, Benjamin in Hong Kong, and um, our other team members in our headquarters, and we're, we are happy to take all your inquiries and questions you have about Hong Kong and help you um, to expand your business in Hong Kong. And... And, and contact us. I think our, uh, we are going to send all um, the presentation to, to all participants with our contact details. And I'm really, really happy to speak to you soon. Okay, back to you, Paula. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks uh, to all our attendees, as well as the speakers once more, Benjamin, uh, Clarence, and uh, Christian. Uh, hope to see you all for a next webinar and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.